are good medicine. That's basically all I have. Everything else is great. Stories are good medicine. So let me elaborate on that theme. Um, stories are at the heart of the healthcare experience, just like they're at the heart of every single human endeavor, from education to entertainment, to journalism, um, to business. And yet I think there's something unique about the relationship between story and healthcare. And we heard it earlier, we heard it from Jen, uh, from Zappos, who told us that just telling her story, just telling her story to another human being on that bus. Am I not turned on? All right, am I turned on? No? Yes? Um, just telling her story to another human being on that bus was a healing experience. And similarly, just listening to the story of another human being is inherently a healing experience. Now, what I'm saying is not new by any means. Think back to the days of the horse and buggy doctor, right? Before doctors had really anything in their black bags, maybe like leeches or something scary like that. But really, they didn't have antibiotics, no MRIs, no fancy full body cat scans. But what they had was their humanity, right? What they had was the ability to just show up and be present for birth and death and disability and suffering and, and the range of life experiences. And you know, in the last 100 plus years, there have been some wonderful things added to that black bag. We have antibiotics and MRIs and fancy full body CAT scans. But what I think many of us are finding is that we have lost that first ancient good medicine, right? We have moved away from that storytelling heart that was the heart of medicine. And I see many of our frustrations with healthcare now emerging from that loss of story, right? We have an incredible problem with uh, lack of access to healthcare, with insurance. Um, even for people who are able to access healthcare, people feel kind of sidelined, voiceless, in their own healthcare, people on the other side of the stethoscope are equally frustrated. We see physician burnout at a rate we've never seen before. Physicians and nurses feel as if they are widget makers in a factory, right? It's this kind of factory line medicine, as opposed to that kind of primal, first human interaction of medicine. And so as pushback, what we've seen across the country are these programs like mine, programs that are alternately called narrative medicine, literature and medicine, humanities and medicine. But they're all seeking to do pretty much the same thing, which is to put story back in the healthcare relationship. And I, in specific, am interested um, not at all in a nostalgic sense of medicine. It's not like, oh, I wish I was back in the day of the horse and the buggy. Not at all. What I'm interested in doing is putting two things side by side in the doctor's black bag. The ability to both read a radiograph, in other words, technological skill, and the ability to read a story. So in other words, that human storytelling skill. Put them both in the black bag together, and here's the rub, at, on an equal platform. And it's my perspective that through a, turn, a return to storytelling, we can actually achieve a more just and a more egalitarian healthcare, right? I understand that the impulse to start calling healthcare providers providers or healthcare workers um, and to call people seeking healthcare, healthcare consumers, I understand that that came from this sort of egalitarian impulse. But I don't think it's been successful. And so I'm interested in rewriting this kind of widget narrative of medicine, right? And going back to the human narrative of medicine. And so in order to do that, let me um, step back for a minute and let me take you to the place where I first felt that deep kind of ancient force that is the power of medicine. And the place that I first learned that as a daughter of immigrants was um, back in India. I would go there for almost every summer vacation. And I would be in my grandmother's enormous bed, which was the same bed that many years later she would actually die in. Um, and we would be there together under the fluttering mosquito net. And it would be fluttering because if the electricity was working, which was not all the time, um, the overhead fan would be going like crazy because it was hot. Right, And the mosquito net would be fluttering. And it was this very literal interpretation of the magical space of storytelling. 
right? It's that magical space that tellers and listeners can engage in, mosquito net or not. Um, and my grandmother would just light up my imagination with these ancient tales of princes and princesses and flying horses and bone-crunching demons and gods and goddesses and all their foibles. And I would feel as if I were drinking from a cup and she was just filling me up with these ancient stories. Or if I was a cup and she was just kind of you know, pouring these stories into me. And so now, whenever I feel intellectually or personally um, or professionally parched, I go back to these old stories. And so, let me kind of give you a taste of this sweet water. Um, let me tell you a Bengali folktale now that my kids really enjoy. And hopefully after that, I'll just draw out a couple more points about story, medicine, and justice. Okay, so, but first I'm gonna tell you my story. So imagine yourself, we're all under the mosquito net. It's a really big mosquito net. Um, and it goes like this. A long, long time ago, before there were things like mirrors in homes, there was a magical mirror propped up in the woods. Now, a wandering storyteller was wandering through the woods, going from town to town telling his stories, and he happened upon the mirror. And not knowing what it was, he became convinced that the face he saw in that mirror was that of his long dead father a man who he had last seen when the father was about the age that this guy was now. And he was ecstatic. He said, Baba, Baba, right, in ecstasy. Wouldn't you know it, who should come the other direction through the woods, wandering town to town, but a wandering minstrel, going from town to town singing his stories, right? And he looks in the mirror and not knowing what it is, became convinced that it's the face of his long dead father, who he had last seen when the father was the age that this man was now, right? And he starts to yell, Baba, Baba, and he's in ecstasy. Now, we know that every story needs a conflict, and this is where the conflict happens. And this is actually the part my kids think is really funny. They say, Mom, grown ups are so silly. And it's true, grown ups are very silly. Um, so they start to fight. It's my father, no, it's my father, no, it's my father, no, it's my father. And they're tussling around, and in the tussle, they happen to look in the mirror together. And that's when the magic happens. Because the storyteller says to the minstrel, oh, that's just you. And the minstrel says to the storyteller, oh, that's just you. And you see, it's only when they look in the mirror together that they can each see the truth about themselves, right? That they can each see their own true face. OK. So what does this have to do with healthcare? Um, I think that the one really important thing that this story has to do with healthcare is that it shows to us that stories are relationships, right? Stories are relationships. The magic happens not with that inanimate mirror, right? A story isn't an object. It's a relationship between two human beings. And I think that this is a pretty intuitive understanding, right? We all get that a story is going to be different depending on who the teller is and who the speaker is, or, or who the listener is, excuse me. Um, right? We all get that I'm going to tell a story differently to all of you than I would at home to my children, than I would to my spouse or you know, my colleague, et cetera. And we get that I would hear a story differently based on all of my cadre of personal previous stories, right? If you remind me of my beloved Aunt Millie, I'm going to hear your story differently than if you frighten me or if you push buttons about race or class or, or make me feel uncomfortable. I'm going to hear those two stories differently. It's a pretty self-evident idea. But yet in medicine, we tend not to remember this. Um, we tend to think of stories as fixed and unchanging and undynamic. And so I tell the medical student, go get me the story, right? as if they're Indiana Jones, and they're going to like run into the jungle and like dig up this treasure and bring it back for me. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of what happens, and it gets us into unjust positions. Let me give you the classic medical example. Anybody who's a doctor or a nurse in the room will uh, you know, get this. Um, I'm the medical student. I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. I'm very nervous. I've spent all night getting my history and writing it up. And in this age-old ritual, I stand in front of my bosses and I present my history. I say, Mr. Jones is a 72-year-old man with pain in his left ear and blah, blah, blah. And they all listen. And they all troop into the room, 
you know, the boss doctor with all the duckling doctors. And wouldn't you know it, the boss doctor, the attending, gets a totally different story, right? Mr. Jones isn't 72, he's 73, it's not his left ear, it's his right toe. And if I'm having a really bad day, his name isn't Mr. Jones at all, right? It's Mr. Smith. Um, and there's two explanations that medicine gives. One, the stupid medical student got it wrong again. Two, even worse, that guy in room 102, he's a bad historian. Let's box him out of his healthcare altogether. Let's rely on the MRI and the lab and the fancy all-body CAT scan, right? Because he's unreliable. Stories are unreliable. But what if? What if we change that narrative? What if we look to stories for a different sort of a truth? Okay, one more quick story. Um, Dory Laub, who's a Holocaust scholar at the Yale Holocaust Archives, tells the tale of collecting a history from an elderly Auschwitz survivor. She was a young woman when she witnessed the first and only Jewish armed uprising at Auschwitz. She's very frail, she's telling her story, but as she starts to tell it, she becomes filled with energy and she fills all the listeners with energy. She says, it was unbelievable. People were running everywhere, and then I saw it. Four of the chimneys of those death chambers, they blew up to the sky. I have goosebumps just retelling it, right? And yet, the Holocaust scholars who are looking at this testimony say, Dory, I'm sorry, we gotta kick this out. This one's a bad historian, right? Because the history books tell us there wasn't four chimneys that blew up, there was just one. And so lest the revisionists who want to say the Holocaust never happened use this against us, let's kick the story out. But Dory Laub says no, no. Story truth is different than historical truth. It is more profound in certain ways. What this woman is testifying to is not four or one chimneys, who cares? She's testifying to the reality of an unimaginable occurrence. In the world she lived in, in the narrative she lived in, Jewish armed uprisings didn't happen. And so that is what she is testifying to. She is testifying to the breakage of a framework. And that is the power of story truth. So let me leave you with this image. Let me leave you with the image of the storyteller and the minstrel looking in that mirror, looking in those streams of stories together, right? The storyteller and the minstrel, the physician and the patient, decision makers, seekers of health care, right? We can all look in those waters together. Uh, the memoirist Anatole Broyard wrote that even as the doctor diagnoses the patient, the patient diagnoses the doctor, right? So what I'm seeking is that sort of transparency and mutuality, that um, embracing of stupidity, that position of awe and humility in the face of someone else's story. Um, the ability to know that I can never fully know your story or fully understand it, but I can approach you, I can engage with you, and perhaps I can look into this stream of personal stories and cultural stories and universal stories with you. And in that process, maybe we can each learn a little bit more truth about ourselves, and maybe we can each see our own true faces. And maybe that is the best medicine of all. Thank you very much.